I am a pair of a red train, and he's got a gold woman. Mother of the train, a grandmother. I can tell you now, she in the grade of stage for a month of 81 grandchildren. Thank you. My Gadiga land sister was a local custodian who was taken to Parramatta's Natives Institute and in 1845 was taken by Reverend John Cartwright to Pajong, Gundingara country near Gunning, New South Wales, to work. I was born at a little central west of New South Wales Wiradjuri town called Peak Hill. However, I spent my younger teenage years with my parents and family in Redfern, the block. You've all heard of the block? Yeah. They said it was notorious, but I lived on the block for 15 years. I read most of my kids there and my grandkids, and we got on fine. And Waterloo. I now live in Waterloo, including Lewis, Caroline, Everly, Vine, and Wellington Streets. That was my stomping grounds. We honour our Gadigal era elders and leaders, including Barangaroo and Pemaway, and many others who fought the first boat people who landed in Sydney Cove in 1770 and 1778. My respects to Gadigal elders, past and present. We honour our matriarchs and patriarchs. Because of them, we can. My respects to all elders and peoples from other First Nations here today. We listen to the old people, ancestors, and they show us the right path. They protect us, they help us, they take care of us. This welcome to country is made in the spirit of peace and harmony with all peoples of modern Sydney. Our aim as local custodians is to establish an atmosphere of mutual respect through the acknowledgement of our ancestors and the recognition of our right to declare our special place in the pre and post history of the Sydney region. Respect is taking responsibility for the past, the present and the future. Evidence of our occupation, ownership and nationhood can be seen everywhere throughout our country. Our signature is in the land, not just in our DNA. Respect is in the fire that warms the camp and the possum skin cloak that shelters all. Respect is in how a woman digs in the earth for yams. Respect is in the rivers, the sea, and the breeze quietly moving through a country. The law of this land says that you must respect and honor all the people and all parts of the country. With this welcome, we ask that you all will respect the law of the country. Give honor, be respectful, be polite, be gentle and patient with all. Respect is everything living and growing. Please look after the land, sea and rivers, then the land, sea and rivers will look after you. In conclusion, I say to you, respects, shapes us, and lifts up the people. Welcome to the land of my ancestors. Welcome to my country. Welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Auntie Jane, for that warm and, and generous welcome. Uh, can I now welcome the Chief Executive of the Major Conference, <laughs> the Major Conservation Council of New South Wales, Jackie Monfield. Thanks so much, Nick. Uh, I'm Jackie Mumford. I'm the Acting CEO of the Nature Conservation Council of New South Wales. I just want to say thank you so much for the warm welcome, Auntie Joan. Um, as we know, Aboriginal history and culture were once denied existence in this country, and um, such a beautiful welcome is one way to restore and maintain cultural practices 
Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land that we're on here tonight and affirm the Nature Conservation Council's commitment to the voice to Parliament on the road to treaty. We also affirm our commitment to hearing all First Nations people's perspective as the referendum nears. I'd like to start tonight by taking a moment to reflect on why we're here. I want you to stand up if you or someone you know was affected by record-breaking floods or fires in the last three years. I want you to stand up if you would like to see or have seen a koala in the wild, or you want to take your grandchildren, nieces and nephews, or the next generation to see a koala in the wild someday. Thank you. And I want you to stay standing, but if you're not yet standing, stand up if you expect the next New South Wales government to prioritise a safe climate future and a clean, healthy environment over developer greed and the fossil fuel lobby. Thanks everyone, you're in the right place. You can take a seat. When we talk about nature and climate, we aren't just talking about a nice bushwalk on the weekend. We're talking about protecting the air we breathe, the food we eat, and the water we drink. This is not just about a safe, livable future. It's about a safe and livable right now. There are people from all walks of life here tonight. This is reflective of the environment movement across New South Wales. We're a broad church. NCC is very proud to host tonight's event and to keep raising the issue of the environment, not only in the lead up to the state election, which I'm sure you can all attest is rapidly approaching, but every single day until nature is thriving and the climate is safe. We're the voice for nature. In forests, rivers, bushland, in the news across the state and inside Parliament House. And I can confidently say that we do this because of the powerful groups we represent. I want to acknowledge over 170 member groups that are members of the Nature Conservation Council that's a here tonight. I especially want to thank our members who've shown up tonight and who brought all of your networks. The Life Australia, the National Parks Association, the Invasive Species Council, Total Environment Centre, Australian Wildlife Society, and I'm sure there are many others that I've missed. Thank you all for being here. I also just want to make a note about uh, some of the independents who are running um, in the in the election this month. And I can see a lot of colourful t-shirts in the room, so and, and I know a bunch of you are here. There are a number of strong independents who have a real chance at being elected to give a place on the stage tonight. Many of these candidates are running with very strong policies on climate and nature and are working hard to show just how many people across New South Wales care deeply about these issues. Tonight, we're joined by independent candidate for Marilyn Joel Hackman. Independent candidate for World Cruise, Karen Fryer. Independent candidate for Lane Co, Victoria Davidson. Victoria, oh, okay. Victoria is supposed to be here. Um, and I think Helen Conway is here. Hello? Yes, someone's waiting for Helen. Oh, Helen's online. Thank you for joining us online, Helen. Um, and I just want to acknowledge all the other MPs and candidates running in the state election who have come along tonight too, and not just tonight, but who have been turning out for electorate-specific specific candidate forums that NCC has been running for the last few weeks. It's been amazing to see the turnout of candidates across those electorates. Whether the policies can be explored tonight or not, we encourage you all to do your own research on the candidates for your electorate uh, and think about their policies in the lead up to election day on March 25. Um, and lastly, before I hand over to the main event, just some housekeeping comments are through the back. Um, if there is an emergency and we need to evacuate, we go straight back up the way we came in. Um, there's a bar set up with some drinks and noodles. Please stick around and join us for a drink after this evening. We'll be sticking to a tight uh, timeline so there'll be plenty of time to um, mingle for a drink. The bar's open till 8 p.m. The event is live on Zoom and we have over 200 people who have joined us virtually as well as the over 400 in the room. Um, and the event is being recorded. We'll hear from each of the candidates and then we'll have questions from the floor which were submitted ahead of time. 
we'll do our best to get through the questions, but as always, uh, we'll be um, trying to stick to time and prioritizing hearing from each of our MPs equally. So we've got a beautiful timekeeper down the front uh, who will be ringing a bell. Each of the candidates will be given three minutes for their initial address. Melanie will ring the bell when they have 30 seconds left, and then she will continue to ring the bell at three minutes on the dot so you know that your time is up. Similarly, when we go to questions, we'll have a minute each to hear from our candidates, and Melanie will ring the bell when you have 15 seconds left, and then ring the bell at a minute, so we'll stick to time. And please react. If one of the candidates says something tonight that you think is great and you want to back it in, give them a clap, give them a cheer, let them know that's what we're, that's what we're here for. Um, of course, we want to remain respectful at all times. The tone for the event this evening is very much supportive, encouraging, welcoming. No booing or disparaging comments or you'll be asked to leave. Um, and you might notice on your seat there was a flyer with a QR code. Um, this event, like all of the advocacy we do at NCC, is funded by people just like you. Uh, who generously give what they can. If you would like to make a donation so we can continue to have the biggest impact we possibly can, please scan the QR code on the flyer and make a donation to NCC. And I'll hand it back to you, Nick. Okay, let's, uh, let's get into it quickly then. Could I first welcome up Minister James Griffin? He was appointed Environment Minister a bit over a year ago. I understand his mum might be in the audience, a member of the Greens, or maybe some of some of her friends, um, who I imagine are quite torn. Anyway, Minister Griffin. Three minutes. Thank you, Nick. Um, well, Auntie Joan, I'd like to uh, begin by thanking you for your insightful and uh, heartfelt welcome to country. And I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respects to elders past and present. To my parliamentary colleagues, Penny Sharp, Sue Higginson, uh, we may disagree on a lot of things, but we always do it quite respectfully. So it's good to see you here this evening. Um, and to the Nature Conservation Council, thank you so much for having us here this evening. It's great to be here to share my vision for the environment in New South Wales. It's a vision that is firmly rooted in reality, in building on work that is already underway and in building partnerships. Just this week, I delivered a massive win for the environment in New South Wales at more than a million acres in size. The New South Wales Liberals and Nationals government has acquired the largest ever parcel of land in the history of New South Wales for addition to our National Parks estate. This place is home to incredible biodiversity, including at least 50 threatened species, 39 ecosystems and internationally significant wetlands that will now be protected forever. Since 2019, this government has secured more than 1 million hectares of land, increasing the National Park Estate by almost 15%. But protecting and conserving the environment is not just about national parks, which is why we're looking forward and we're committed to delivering so much more. We're rapidly rolling out the more than $190 million New South Wales koala strategy, which is the single largest investment in any species by any government in this nation. We've returned 10 locally extinct mammals to our world leading rewilding sites in the last four years, the first time that this has happened anywhere in the world. We're investing more than $2 billion through the last budget in the environment and heritage and finding new ways to better value and protect our natural capital. We've banned problematic single use plastics and are committed to tripling the plastics recycling rate by 2030. We now have more than 2.3 million hectares of private land being protected and managed across New South Wales. And it was within my first few weeks as environment minister that I strengthened the powers of the EPA, helping ensure that there's an even tougher cop on the beat. That's just some of what we're doing. These are nation leading initiatives and are fundamental to achieving our vision of conserving, protecting and growing our natural environment in New South Wales. These are practical, science-backed conservation principles, fundamental and built in building partnerships. It's how we will leave a positive environmental legacy for our kids and their kids. And the partnership of passionate environmentalists like the NCC has been instrumental in the success of conservation and protection in our state. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Next, let's uh, hear from Penny Sharp, uh, Environment Spokesperson for the ALP.
Three minutes for a politician is very, very difficult, but I'll do my best. Auntie Joan, thank you so much for your um, welcome to country. And I want to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respect to their elders past and present. But I also make the commitment that an elected Labor government will finally get standalone Aboriginal cultural heritage legislation as part of this state. To Jackie, to new chair Karen Lotton, and I want to particularly acknowledge former chair Professor Don White, and to the many friends in this room who stand up every single day to care for our environment, to be the voice for the environment, and for fight for the smallest tree to the biggest tree and to every animal in between. I really just want to acknowledge the work that you do every day, and I look forward to doing that into the future. Because let's be serious here, we only have one planet. All of us are lucky to spend some time on it, even if it's only for a few short decades. But we know that the planet we live on, and in particular in this state, the we are fortunate to live in, is thousands and thousands of years old. It is old, it is diverse, it is beautiful. It is our responsibility to pass on to future generations a better state than how we find it. The health of our planet is the key to the future health and well-being of humanity. It's as serious as that. To ensure a healthy planet, we must care for the plants, the animals, the ecosystems, the landscapes and the natural heritage that cleans our air, purifies our water and makes being human worthwhile. In New South Wales, we live on an ancient land that is telling us that it's under pressure in a way that is accelerating and beginning to cause serious harm. Climate change and biodiversity loss are heading towards a tipping point that requires urgent and focused action. Labor in New South Wales refuses to accept that the challenges our environment face cannot be turned around. Our approach considers protection of the environment and action on climate change as the core business of state governments. After 12 years of removal of key environmental protections, cuts to monitoring and compliance of things like land clearing and water use, the neglect of national parks and sustained koala wars, the latest environment report tells us the problem. Of the 38 indicators, 18 are getting worse and 12 are barely stable. Threatened species are up and getting worse. The spread of invasive species is so bad that it's now costing us $2 billion a year. Land clearing is getting worse. The vision that Labor has for our environment is that we want to be the world leader in conservation with the world's best national work parks and wildlife service, a system of conservation across all land tenures that's focused on climate change mitigation, adaptation, stopping biodiversity loss. Not one, just part, not one part of government needs to do this. We need to do this together. And we need to do it with industry and we need to do it with the people in this room and the community who are demanding change. In 24 days, the people of New South Wales will have the opportunity to decide who they trust the stakes are high. The next generation will determine what future we're leaving our, grandch our grandchildren. Uh, th thank you, Penny. Before uh, I invite Sue Higginson of the Greens to the lectern, I should note that an invitation was extended to the, to the Nationals, but they have, have not attended this evening. Sue. Good evening all. Thank you so much, Auntie, for your wonderful, beautiful, warm welcome. I also pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land, the Gadigal people, the Aura Nation. Um, Greens New South Wales have already put on the table our plan for truth and treaty. We are the only state right now that is not progressing truth and treaty in fullness and honesty. And we want action. And that's what we've taken to this election. It is grim. The stakes are high. We know that we are actually in an extinction crisis. There's no mincing words. We're going to lose koalas by 2050 unless we change things. Right now, I want to acknowledge the people who have come here today from the front lines who are trying to stop the logging of our forests as we speak. Welcome and thank you. They are here. I've only got three minutes. Wait. They are here. They, we are literally right now flogging the last of our public native forests. I've been traveling these forests over the last few months and I cannot tell you how grim it really is in our public forest estate right now. We know 40% of them got smashed by fire. We know they, their protection is essential. We need to stop logging right now. And guess what? If we stop, that is 76 million tonnes of carbon that won't be emitted into the atmosphere between now and 2050. We need, right now, we need 
We know what we need to do. We need to build our protected area network. We need to build it by 30% by 2030. We know that's 14 million hectares of land that needs to be included. That's a million hectares a year more. And we know that a million hectares over the last 12 years of coalition government is just nowhere near what we need to be doing right now to protect, to, to protect nature and ourselves. I'm from Lismore. Yesterday, we celebrated one year from when we got smashed by one of the sickest, most unhealthiest rivers in our state. Our rivers are suffering so much right now under the stress and exploitation and the lack of care and nourishment and the lack of resources that we need to go back in to fixing and healing our rivers. So we know what we need to do. We know where the stakes are. We've got choices to make right now, right during this month in the lead up to this election. The one thing I can't impart harder enough to all of you is no matter what you're doing, make sure you have an electoral strategy between now and 25th of March. No matter who forms government, you need as many Greens as you can get in this parliament to make whoever forms government go further and faster for our planet. We're doing well, we're doing well. We're, we're just three minutes behind schedule. We're gonna break for a very quick moment. If I could ask all of you to stand, we're gonna get the uh, the MPs to stand here at the front and gonna get a photograph of them with the crowd of all of you behind. And we're gonna do it really quickly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's a photographer asking for energy. I don't know what that means. Come on. Okay. Thank you all very much for that. We're going to move straight into the. Um, the moderated questions, uh, as, as Jackie explained beforehand, these questions were submitted before. The first few will be asked by their authors, and then I will jump in towards the end to ask a couple more in the hope of, of getting through a few more. Could I first invite up Susie Russell from the Northeast Forest Alliance? Thank you. Native forest logging harms our wildlife, destroys our catchments, emits millions of tonnes of climate pollution and costs taxpayers to prop up the industry. How would you protect these native forests from logging, particularly those on public land, and recognise the other values of our forests, such as biodiversity, catchment protection, emission reduction and carbon storage, and recreation? Minister, could you take that first question for us? Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question um, and the a one minute response. That's <laughs> um, it's uh, I think we all recognize the dramatic uh, and catastrophic impact that the bushfires had 2019 20 on our um, our public land and in, indeed state forests. Any activity or operation that takes place in state forests needs to be done with the most robust governance in place. And that is why I continue to support and back the EPA. I've been with them out in some difficult terrain in work that they've been doing to make sure that they are a tough cop on the beat when it comes to governing and regulating what happens in those forests. That, that being a regulatory setting, there is also a great opportunity to look at the other opportunities around recreation, conservation and carbon sinks when it comes to uh, elements of the state forest. But in order to do that, we need to have a very genuine discussion with communities that rely on that industry. And that is something that I think is an exciting vision for the future. It's quick, I'm sorry, it is very quick. Um, 
the first thing that Labor wants to do is recognise the role of forests in terms of um, biodiversity and carbon. There's a lot of work that's been done through things like the Timber Inquiry and the Koala Inquiry that really requires a much more robust response than we've had from the New South Wales government yet, and that's something that Labor will do, and that includes assessment of forests uh, for all of their values. That's one thing we'll do. Second, we're going to work, and people in the stream have worked very hard for this, to get a great koala national park on the mid-north coast. It's going to be a very important part of the puzzle and the future of forests in that area. And the third thing that I would do if I become the uh, Environment Minister, I'm lucky to get to do that, is to make sure that we get back into the, into the business of um, establishment plans for national parks. Um, we need to do that. It's been, what, there hasn't been one done since 2009. The future of our, all of that and our protected areas and the commitments we've made federally rely on it. Penny, just, just a quick follow-up on the Great Koala National Park. What would the shape of that park be? Would it be the, the park that has been described and foreseen by the activists who supported it for so long? Or would it be smaller? And then would it be accompanied by restrictions on old growth logging? Look, we've said, so basically there's two parts to it. There's already around 140,000 hectares that's already in reserve. There's 176,000 hectares of public land. that We've said that we'll, be, we'll assess and we'll work through in terms of what goes in or out. So the scope of it, we're very deliberate about that. We've said that we're going to work through the process with people to deal with that, but our commitment to a great koala national park is absolutely solid and we believe is fundamental to saving koalas in this state. Thank you. Sue, could we, could we have a response from you, please? Um, yeah, so we just need to stop the nonsense. We've actually got to take action, take steps, and we need to be immediate about it. We know how to do it. We have to just end the logging of our public native forest estate. We have to bring... We have to bring workers along with us. We know exactly what that will cost. We're talking about 1,000 workers across the entire state. We know how to transition 1,000 workers. There's an economic plan on the table of how to do that. And the benefits that will follow from protecting our public native forest estate soon, not later. Koalas aren't going to wait for the Koala National Park for Labor to organise it. And in terms of the coalition, they're actually right now as we speak, flogging the guts out of the very forest that will make up the Great Koala National Park. In no uncertain terms, we are getting it wrong right now. The Southeast Forest is like a war zone. We can, we've got a very limited time to turn this around. The science is on the table. Even the government's own independent expert body has said we need to recalibrate. We need to do it and we need these people to commit to it. What? Thank you. One more brief follow-up for, for the Minister. Given the evidence about climate and extinctions in this state, particularly the condition of the koala, why does the government still support old growth logging, which doesn't appear to be turning a profit? So the um, forested land in New South Wales accounts for about 10%, um, and half of state forests are already quarantined for conservation. Of the remaining half, there is a great opportunity and our response to the Upper House Timber Inquiry demonstrated that there is immediate action and it's underway to increase dramatically plantations, softwood and hardwood. And then equally, if you wanna have a real discussion about what a transition looks like, if we are willing to have that as a, as a community, then it does mean talking to groups and communities that are affected. I've met with the CFMEU representing timber workers down in the South Coast. They do wanna have this discussion, but we need to have a pragmatic real one that is quite nuanced and looks at the detail of how the transition takes place. So there are opportunities to reflect um, the, the complete value from uh, carbon sequestration and also recreational opportunities that, that those forests represent. And I think that's, that's something that we should absolutely be looking at. Thank you. We'll, we'll race on now to the next question. I won't keep jumping up. The next question is going to be asked by Stephanie Knox, a West Ride resident who recently visited the Macquarie Marshes. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, good evening, everyone. Yes, um, I, I did have the privilege of, of visiting the Macquarie Marshes uh, late last year um, while it has water in it and what a fantastic place it is. However, uh, it's not always like that. And my question to the panel is this. Um, the Ramsar listed Macquarie Marshes west of Dubbo have shrunk by at least two thirds since large scale irrigation developed upstream. Yet, New South Wales has failed to meet its commitments under the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Will you bring New South Wales into compliance with the Murray-Darling Basin Plan by the legal deadline? Thank you. 
Penny, what, what would a Labor government do? Yeah. Well, the thing that we need to do first is we need to basically get the water resource plans in and finalised. Um, they haven't been. And if we're going to actually meet the deadline that we're legally required to do, we've got to make do that work very, very quickly. I too have been up to Macquarie Marshes. I've been there when it was in drought, actually. Um, and it was a pretty um, sad place to be given it's so important and so beautiful. Um, Labor is very concerned about the water theft that it's occurred in the basin over time and the fact that we're not going to meet our own the requirements that we actually set out. We've got a big task to do if we're elected, but as I said, the, the priority is that, yes, we want to meet the requirements. Um, we're going to have to do that urgently, but we're going to have to wait and see in terms of um, what's actually there and perhaps Minister Griffin can give us an idea of what we'd find if we're elected in March. <laughs> well, okay, okay, Minister Griffin, jump in there. Sure, thank you. Um, uh, one of the first places I went as minister was to the Macquarie Marshes. Beautiful, beautiful spot, uh, full at the time, teeming with wildlife. Correction to Penny's point, uh, New South Wales is responsible for 20 of the 33 uh, water sharing resource plans. All of them have been submitted to the Commonwealth and are awaiting, are awaiting accreditation. Um, in parallel to that, we recently, uh, in partnership with the Nature Conservancy, um, acquired 55,000 hectares with the Nauru Nauru Tribal Council, which contains internationally significant wetlands. They are now protected in perpetuity. So we're expanding the wetlands that we have under conservation as we speak. The government is committed to working with the Commonwealth to make sure that we do what we need from our end on the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. And finally, I agree that water theft is absolutely unforgivable. Sue, could we have your perspective on that? Yeah, I mean, at this point, meeting our obligations under the Murray-Darling Basin Plan is about the lowest bar we need to be striving for. We know that things have radically changed since we first started at the development of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan over a decade ago. We know that some of the data that has fed into the plan has been manipulated, is not clear in terms of the, the most up-to-date current climate forecasts. We know that the Macquarie right now, the only reason we're still talking about it in any shape or form is because we've just had three La Niñas in a row. I was there in 2019 and it was catastrophic. The next one's going to be worse, there's no doubt. This is an international Ramsar wetland like the others along the Murray-Darling Basin system. We need to seriously lift our game and right now we need to be prioritising 100% in the centre what water is required to sustain the life of the Macquarie marshes, not what allocations an irrigator is owed or what the mar water market may say. We've got to turn this around. Thank you. For the, the next question, can I invite Diana Pride, President of Save Sydney's Koalas? Uh, Thank you. <clears throat> Since 2016, land clearing has tripled in New South Wales. Do you acknowledge that this is driving koalas and other wildlife towards extinction? And will you commit to end broad scale land clearing and the failing offset system and how? Thank you. Yes, please go. Um, absolutely. Wasn't 2016 such a sad moment in our native veg history and in terms of biodiversity conservation? It was a real disaster. We literally ripped up a system that was just starting to work across the landscape in terms of ending broad scale land clearing in New South Wales. The coalition government, when they introduced these reforms, actually said in no uncertain terms land clearing will increase. And that's what we're seeing now. So if we think this is some accidental, unintended consequence, we're wrong. This was the product and the architecture of this was John Barillaro and his colleagues in Parliament. Is it, is it, is it um, contributing to the extinction crisis? My word, it is. We were talking 50, 60 years ago that we knew if we were going to address the extinction crisis, if we were going to avoid it, we needed to protect habitat. The way we protect habitat is we end broad scale land clearing. The self accessible codes that we have right now are an international disgrace when we're talking about the quality of vegetation we have 
in this in this stage. Minister Griffith, would you care to respond to that? Thanks. Uh, <laughs> Look, 70% of New South Wales is, uh, is held in private hands. And so to turn this around, we need to work in partnership with private landholders. We have expanded the National Park Estate by a million hectares. We have founded the Biodiversity Conservation Trust, which has put under protection 2.3 million hectares of land since 2017. And in addition to that, I've commenced a review, a statutory review of the Biodiversity Conservation Act, which will ensure that we do get the regulatory settings right when it comes to land management, land control and land clearing. That review is being led by um, Ken Henry, former Commonwealth Treasury Secretary. That is open for people to provide their feedback and their input into right now. And I look forward to responding and adopting the recommendations put forward by, by uh, Mr Henry, which will go a large way in resolving a number of the issues that have been put forward as this part of this question. Thank you, Penny. Koalas are on track for extinction in the wild by 2050. We've got 28 years. It's really very urgent. Land clearing is absolutely contributing to their decline. And if you speak to the ecologists that many of us have, who cry when they come to inquiries over the loss of populations they previously used to watch, then you'd take it extremely seriously. Labor's committed to stopping the runaway land clearing that we've seen since the government weakened the laws in 2016. We need to work through the process and we're disappointed that the government promised a three-year statutory, promised a review three years in before all the damage was done. And now we're getting one at five years and we're going to use that. We're going to do that to fix the biodiversity offset scheme, which is frankly managing decline and failing and not working for one single person in this state, let alone the animals that and the plants that rely on it. And we're also um, going to work very closely across tenures we can't save koalas and we save the we save the corridors no matter where they are. Thank you. I'm going to turn now to some, some more questions which have been submitted by the audience. They're not my questions, but I'm going to, to read them from here. I'm going to mix up who I come to first in the interests of fairness. I'll also thoroughly confuse myself doing that. If I skip anyone, please tell me. Uh, I'm sure you will. <laughs> but the first question refers to um, raising the Warragamba Dam Wall, which would inundate World Heritage listed bushland and cultural sites. Uh, Penny, could you tell us what the what Labor's policy would be regarding the Dam Wall? Should you should you win government? We won't raise it. There is absolutely no point in saying that you care about world heritage listing which is the highest level of listing that any land can have and should be protected forever if you're prepared to flood it because you're trying to solve a problem that the project that's being proposed won't actually fix you can't say that you care about the song lines of first nations people and you say that you're going to hear and listen around about their um, cultural heritage if you're prepared to basically flood the um, swimming holes and the stories and the song lines of the Gunungurra people. Labor believes that um, there is serious issues in terms of flooding and evacuation in New South Wales. The government's had 12 years to do something about it. Instead, they're just promising a dam wall that won't fix the problem and will ruin the national park and we won't do it. So I, I suspect I can predict yeah. parts of the Greens' response, yeah. but let's have it. Um, well, I think probably now is the time for me to remind everyone that the current Premier did stand somewhere near the Warragamba Dam Wall and say, we are the government for people, not plants. And, you know, like it, maybe it was cute, maybe it was funny, maybe it was something, but i tell you what it was. It was hellishly divisive. It was incredibly disingenuous and it's not fair to keep doing this to us as a community, as a state who is looking for genuine leadership, particularly on environment, our planet, the very thing. And, and as Penny says, there we are talking about world heritage, even in liberal language, even in teal, red, green language, whatever we want to call it. This is apparently the highest value we place on environment. And yet here we are talking actually about letting it go when we really don't need to do that. So I say to the Premier and the government, 
please stop dividing us and please stop polarizing the environment as if it's something that you can play with. James, would you respond to that? But, but also perhaps it is worth addressing specifically those comments about a government for people, not plants. That would have had an impact on a lot of people, a lot of people in this room, I suspect. Yeah, and I'm here tonight to front the people in this room and this audience um, to talk about a difficult subject. And this is a difficult one. The Hawkesbury Nepean flood review back in 2016 recommended that the raising of the Warrup Gamba Dam was the next appropriate step. That is, however, subject to um, assessments and rigorous environmental impact studies. Those studies are going through and being considered at the moment. Ultimately, it is a decision for the planning minister and has another level of uh, review, which is the Commonwealth EPBC Act. This is difficult. We all know and have seen the impact of floods on livelihoods, on the environment and on communities. It is a very difficult one, um, but I am proud of the work that my department has done to show environmental leadership in putting forward frank and fearless advice when it comes to the impact that this would have on um, a World Heritage listed area and and the environmental impact that that may come with the, the development. Okay, thank you. Let's um, that is all of you. Yes, let's move on to a, an equally difficult topic: uh, feral horses in the Kosciuszko National Park. After a, a bill passed by the coalition government a couple of years ago, horses appeared to be protected under world under wild horse heritage. Uh, over, over some native species, people would argue, or activists have argued to me in any event. Uh, Penny, could you tell us how would a Labor government go about drastically reducing the number of wild horses in Kosciuszko National Park, which according to a recent count have jumped to about 18,000? Yes, I saw your op-ed on it, Nick. It was very good. Um, I just want to say this. Look, Labor opposed the wild, heritage, the wild horse heritage bill at the time, and we continue to oppose it. It does absolutely nothing except accelerate the destruction of the unique, fragile Kosciuszko National Park. This was done simply as a deal with the um, with the National Party, and I know that there are members of the Liberal Party who did not support it, but who were forced to do so. The real issue, though, now is that there's a horse management plan that's got a commitment to actually getting the horses down to three thousand. Um, Labor's priority will to be do that as quickly as possible and to make sure that we have the resources to ensure that it can be done. It needs to be done humanely, but we are failing. If there's another 4,000, if there's another 4,000 horses in the park, the water and all of the other threatened species are going to be dead before we can ever get that, get that plan finished. Would Labor uh, authorise aerial shooting? At this point, that's not part of what we would talk, what we would want to do. As I said, if we're elected, we've got the horse management plan, we've got to get it down as quickly as possible. We want to put more resources into it. But the key thing is getting the horses out of the park as quickly as possible. Sue, could you tell us how uh, yep. Greens would use their voice to, to help remove those horses and what policies they'd support to do so? Um, absolutely. Our job is to go further and faster, like I said at the outset. And right now we know that um, the plan is not a plan to protect Kosciuszko National Park. The plan that we've got right now was a compromise plan put on the table and the management plan is, is not going to protect Kosciuszko. We actually are currently supportive of what the RSPCA and the best practice recommendation is to eradicate the, um, the feral horses as quickly and humanely as we can. And yes, that does include aerial shooting because if we're looking at what the best advice we've been given is, that's what it reads as. So whatever placating and toning down we wanna do, it's not going to help us. And can I just say on that point, I'm actually a horse chick. I've got some Brumbies at home. I took them out of the Guy Fawkes wilderness myself. I've been working on this. I've been watching this issue. I absolutely love horses, but they just don't belong. We have some hard choices to make. Thanks, sir. James. Yeah. Thank you. Well, look, we, we've been crystal clear about this. We have a plan, and that plan with respect to Sue has had input from diverse voices experts and scientists and professionals in the field of dealing with invasive species. The plan is clear. It says get those feral horses down to 3,000 in Kosciuszko National Park. And that is what we are committed to absolutely doing. The second point I'll make is that there is th this is a very divisive issue. And 
I will back every single day of the week, the work that our National Parks Agency do and the staff and the work that they do down there on the ground. And they do not deserve to put up with what they've had to put up with in trying to deliver and implement this plan. We are, yeah. I think, I think everyone would agree with that. Yeah, and I make that point because we have been trying to implement the plan as quickly and as rapidly as possible. And there have been challenges to do with safety that have made that quite complicated, but we are absolutely committed to forging ahead and getting that number down to 3,000. I want to thank the many people in this room who have backed that in and have supported the works of Parks to get on the way with that plan. Can I push you a little bit on this, though? That If you gave that plan another year or two and the numbers were still rapidly increasing, as they have historically, would you consider aerial culling? Well, we'd have to go back to working with and engaging with the experts that have provided input into the plan, the likes of the RSPCA, the Invasive Species Council and others to really look at uh, how all, all methods, whether it's passive trapping, rehoming uh, and, uh, and lethal, lethal method, methods. So, you know, I think we'll take stock, we publish, we are transparent with the plan, the numbers are published every six months. We'll continue to do that so that everybody has visibility of where it's going and how it's tracking. I'll, I'll get you... Yep, sure. Um, you know, the background paper, though, actually has already said this. It's already put it on the table. Your, the, the paper says that aerial is one of the desired preferred ways, but it's too controversial to do that right now. It's not palatable. So your job was meant to be to go out and tell people why this was the best option and why we were going to do it. This idea of our poor environment having to compromise along the way, so much so that we may actually lose part of that unbelievable environment that we know as Kosciuszko because we are compromising is just not fair anymore. I'd like to, to be give, honest. I'd like to give uh, James a quick moment to respond to that. Yeah, so I, I reject that view. I mean, I think that we have a plan. It has been considered and reviewed by the likes of the RSPCA, local community and other stakeholders and had expert input. We are working that through. We are phasing it in as quickly as possible. And to the point earlier, it's all well and good to, to uh, make that comment that uh, aerial shooting is the way to go. We are undertaking the biggest amount of, of feral animal control, which includes aerial shooting across our parks estate ever. Okay, I think we I think we've made what you, you've made the points that you, that you will there, um, Penny. I'd, I'd like to to, to go, come to you and ask about uh, what I in shorthand call in my mind thirty thirty thirty. But I should be clear: what would a Labor government do to ensure that New South Wales takes part in Australia's goal of protecting thirty percent of land, thirty percent of oceans by twenty thirty? Um, we're committed to it. We're very relieved that we have a federal government who's interested in not only being committed to it, but also looks like they'll be investing over time to make sure that we can get there. Um, we'll work closely with them to see what the New South Wales contribution is. As I said, we're looking at expanding national parks. There's obviously the marine park estate as well, which is um, we need to look at how protected areas are operating within that area. The one point that I would make, though, is that the 30% isn't all going to be national park. And the other, the, the very, the, and it really goes back to some of the other comments I've made earlier tonight, which is for us to be serious about um, dealing with threatened species and doing the wildlife corridor work, we have to work across tenures. So I, I would say that, yes, we're absolutely committed to the 30%. We need to work through what that is, but it's not all going to be national parks, but we do need as quickly as possible to be looking at how we're keeping trees in the ground no matter where the land is. James, does a, would a coalition government support 30-30-30 goals? Absolutely. This is one of the most exciting things for New South Wales and Australia. And at the New South uh, National Environment Minister's meeting, I put our hand up as a state to lead the discussion and lead the contribution as a country as to how we'll help the Commonwealth Government get there. New South Wales um, marine estate is already at 35% uh, some form of protection and we're around 12-15% on land. But of course, this is a national target. So what I've done is set up a nature positive advisory panel led by John Pierce AO to help look at what types of land, to Penny's point, cross tenure needs to be put forward to make a contribution from New South Wales, a leading contribution so that we can get to 30 by 30. And the important point around this is it's not just what ecosystems or bioregions are contributed from New South Wales, but how they are then managed into the future and who does that. So it's a great opportunity and uh, New South Wales will make a great contribution to 30 by 30 for this country. 
So I don't think cephalogists are suggesting be forming government, but you will be having a very strong voice That's right. in the next government. Yeah. Could you, uh, whoever, or, or whoever the next government is, could you respond? Um, yeah, look, I mean, I hate to sound drab, but the 30 by 30 by 30 and contributing to the national um, commitment is actually pretty low bar. I mean, it's a great bar. Absolutely. It's a brilliant bar. We love it. But it is low bar. We're nearly there. The, the nation is actually very close. Scott Morrison committed to it. Like, let's be real. That's where the commitment actually is. So what we talk about with 30 by 30 is let's go. Let's do this. Let's protect 30% of New South Wales by 2030. Right now, there's only 10.5% of our land protected um, legally. Let's do it. Well, okay, 10.7, 10 I think it is. Um, so let's do it. Let's strive. Let's get 30%. And, and let's do it because it's actually brilliant for the economy. Let's do it for that reason, if not any other. Thank you. Um, one of the final questions. If you're Environment Minister after the election, James, what would you like to leave for your grandchildren, what would you like your personal legacy to be? Thank you. Well, I've got a little four-year-old boy and a two-and-a-half-year-old girl, and they are front of my mind when I do this job uh, every single day. It's been a privilege to do it for the last 15 months. And I think the legacy is about continuing, for, for me, the fact that 70% of this state is held in private hands means that we must continue to work with private landholders whether we like it or not. And that in involves resetting some of the discussions and the partnerships that are there. I would love to see more of New South Wales conserved and I would love to make sure that our national parks estate continues to grow. And for me, also dealing with the COSI issue is one great legacy that I'd love to leave. Thank you very much. Sue. So, um, I don't quite have as many grandkids as auntie. I've got seven and maybe one more on the way. I'm not sure, but... Um, um, I want, I, I want to leave, I want the world for the grandkids to be where they are connected to this land, where the land speaks to them, they speak to the land. Every time they are on the land, they know what their purpose is. They understand what they're looking at, what they're feeling. I want them to understand and I want traditional knowledge to be at the forefront. I want it to be what guides us and what leads us and what brings us all together because it is the land and it is the health of the land. And having, having a vision where connection is absolutely key means that we will be healthy, we will be vibrant, and we will be able to know that our grandkids are going to take on the challenge of the changing climate, which is going to be extreme, no matter what we do now, but they will do it in the best stead that they have they can. James, New South Wales has made really significant... Oh, oh, Penny, oh Penny, pardon me, thank you. <laughs> That's okay, thanks, Nick. I wanted, well, there's the very big picture, which is really, I, I agree with uh, Sue in relation to the, everyone being connected to land and understanding what actually keeps us healthy and whole. But for me, I, what I would like to leave this state, and I hope I get an opportunity to do so, is one, a state where we value the environment in all of the things that state governments do in our planning system, in our transport system, in everything that we do, there's actually an understanding that to turn around the crisis that we've identified, we have to take action. That includes valuing things. A tree's not just a tree. It cleans our air. It clears our water. It, it sequesters carbon. It's a home and it provides shade. Um, the valuing of environmental assets as part of core business is very important. And I want to make sure that there are koalas still in the wild. Thanks, Penny. And pardon me, uh, we, we have time to address climate, which is obviously absolutely critical. The New South Wales government does have a record to boast about here, James, but um, what what contribution could, your, could a re-elected coalition make to seizing opportunities to push even further on climate and, and on keeping the world to close to 1.5 degrees or below? Yeah, well... Objectively, New South Wales has done an outstanding job when it comes to climate. We were one of the first jurisdictions, we were one of the first jurisdictions in the world to commit to net zero by 2050. And we've updated our 
our uh, target for 70% by 2035. We are absolutely committed to that. Um, and that has been driven over the past four years by our policies around the electricity infrastructure roadmap, which has also then kicked off in our, our renewable energy zones right across New South Wales, which have been oversubscribed uh, in terms of people wanting to get on and build and create uh, renewable energy that will power this state into the future. We're absolutely committed to turbocharging that and continuing to do the work on it. Um, and obviously you have a very energetic uh, Minister Keane who is uh, continuing to lead the charge on that. I think an important question is, um, what is Labor's target and are we going to hear it tonight? Uh, well, let's come back to that. I'd like to hear from Sue first. Um, I, I think that it is just insert, absurdly, insidiously hypocritical that we are talking about boasting our record when we are actually one of the states that is fueling the climate crisis. We are actually exporting the climate crisis, and we don't account for those scope three emissions right here in New South Wales. We just send them offshore and we say, hey, look, we're meeting our climate targets. We want to end coal and gas, and we think we think we need to do it sooner rather than later. And in fact, in fact, quite frankly, this government is planning to continue to count the emissions of, of coal, even in this state, up until 2050. That's unacceptable. That's too long. We've got to get off the absurd corporate profit-driven exploitative agenda we have right now that is called Coal and Gas New South Wales. Thank you. Let's give that. The last words of Penny on this very critical issue. What, what could a Labor government do to extend New South Wales' ambition? Here's three things that we're going to do. We're going to legislate targets. The businesses, currently the government says that we're going to just get there pretty much with business as usual. Labor's going to legislate the targets. We're going to put in place an independent, scientifically based net zero commission that is going to do the planning and every year report to parliament and require a response in terms of how we're going to get to net zero it's going to work across all the industries so that we've got the choices that we've made to make sure that we get there this is not just a commitment based on one mp or a few good people or the government of the day this is the commitment to the people of new south wales and we've announced a new publicly owned security um, renewable energy security corporation to get those renewable energy transition going faster. It is good that we have the renew renew renewable energy zones, but they are way behind. The transition is not happening fast enough. Privatisation has been a problem in relation to this. Labor's going to stop that and we're going to get the renewables moving as fast as possible. Let's understand we're undertaking the largest economic transition since the Industrial Revolution, we do not have a moment to wait. Thank you all. I am going to let the last words go to Jackie Mumford, who I think has a final question. Thank you all. Thanks, Nick. Last question for the evening. Will you commit, if elected, as the future Environment Minister of New South Wales, will you commit to coming to a public forum hosted by Nature Conservation Council within six months of the election, where you can outline your plan for the next four years and how we can work together to conserve New South Wales' beautiful environment? For each of our candidates. <laughs> you betcha. I've had a great night. Is, is it... No, absolutely. Um, a commitment. You do an amazing job. Uh, such an important voice for so many organisations, as you've outlined tonight. And absolutely, given the opportunity, we'll be here again. Thank you. Um, yes, so many of you have met on so many occasions. You have informed so much of our thinking and the policies that Labor's committed to. So, of course. Um, I've got a feeling that absolutely I'll be here, but I've got a feeling... I may still be on the front lines of the forest fight after hearing tonight. So I will definitely be here, absolutely. But um, yeah, I'm hoping very much that we are here to celebrate that we have ended native forest logging at least, and that Labor's legislated climate targets are a little bit more ambitious than the current ones. Thank you. And I'd like to, to, to close up, I'd just like to um, ask the audience to join me in thanking Nico Malley for emceeing this evening. I want to thank each of the candidates, Minister James Griffin, Penny Sharp from the Labor Party and Sue Higginson from the Greens. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And thank you to all of you for joining us, for being here tonight uh, and for your ongoing commitment to the environment. 
please um, keep an eye out for all the opportunities that you continue to, you can continue to be involved with the Nature Conservation Council in the lead up to election day, um, including handing out scorecards on pre-poll um, and on the day. Um, a reminder that there's a flyer on your on your chair tonight with a QR code. You can make a donation so that we can continue to do this work. Um, and the bar is going to be open. Please stick around, join us for a drink. And if there's any further questions, we can take it to the candidates after uh, by the bar. Thank you all. I would like our political representatives to please listen. There is something that is important that was not discussed in this forum, and that is our water, and that is the great artesian basin, and that is the Polygar Forest and the Gomoroi fight to protect all of our water. Now, both the Liberal and National and Labour parties, all three parties, have signed away the main recharge zone, which is the Polygar Forest, which is one of the major carbon sinks, if I may remind you, away to Santos. For coal seam gas. First stage is 850 coal seam gas wells, and seven stages have been approved. Tanya Plibersek has just signed off on more Santos drilling in Queensland. You talk about conserving the koalas, you talk about conserving the forests. What is the use of it if you don't protect our water? This continent, this continent is nothing without its groundwater. Why? Because it is the driest continent on this earth. Without the single largest underground water reservoir on this continent, if not the earth, this continent will cease to exist. Our flora and fauna will cease to exist. So I say to each of the politicians, which one of you is going to cease Santos's coating gas activity when both of you have signed up on it? Please stick to the answer. We want yes or no, or are you going to sacrifice our water on this continent for a bit of cash in your pockets? I want the answer. I want to know which one of the politicians are going to cease Santos from pillaging from a royal country. Which one of you? Which one of you is going to stop the desecration of Kerala capital of this continent, Canada? Which one of you is going to stop Santos from pillaging the food bowl in Liverpool Plains?